this passage has some deep doctrine, and in a way it kind of summarizes a lot of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, telling you what that old temple was for and the symbol of it all. Jesus Christ is better than the old temple. He's better than the old sacrifice. He's better than the altar. He's better than that high priest. He's better than it all. He has done away with that. Notice here in this chapter it calls that the First Testament. But now we're under the New Testament. Same lingo would just say that we're in the New Covenant. So we are a New Covenant church. The same means a New Testament church, right? Uh, because of the Testament of Christ, we are in covenant with Him for salvation by faith. He's finished the work. It says uh, that He appeared once in the end of the world. He only had to die one time for all sins. We don't crucify Him again. He was crucified. It says in the next chapter, cha you know, chapter 10, verse 10, at the end of it, it says, once for all. So He was sacrificed one time for all of your sins, for everybody. Now the choice is up to you whether or not you will receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. I bring you to this chapter in particular because as he's talking about reforming that old way, it never was by the law in the Old Testament. Looking forward, it cannot possibly be by the law in the New Testament. But he brings it to our attention that there were problems with that old system. In the time of the Lord Jesus Christ as He walked the earth, the temple and the priests and the teachers and the rabbis, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, it was hijacked from what God had originally intended. It's almost like the spiritual leaders at that time, were most of them were false and unbelieving and preaching a different covenant, a different form of salvation than, when, than what was originally given. So he says it was broken, the people were broken, the system was broken, they didn't understand it was time to reform it. So he says just that. If we'll look at verse number 10, Hebrews 9, look with me in verse number 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Whenever somebody says Jesus did away with the law, well, it says he fulfilled the law. And what that means is they no longer have a temple service where they have special meats and drink offerings, poor offerings, heave offerings. There's no washing. These are carnal or fleshly, bodily sacrifices that were done to picture Christ to come. He's fulfilled them all. Now he has reformed the system. That doesn't mean Jesus did away with thou shall not steal or lie or murder. All, right? Those, all that still stands. That's always stood even before the law was given. Right? It's always been there. The law existed prior to the flood. But it's important he uses this phrase here, a time of reformation. You say, what is the time of reformation? Well, I'm glad you asked. It defines it literally in the next line, in the next verse. Look at verse number 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, He lived a perfect sinless life. It tells us in Hebrews He was uh, uh, tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He was totally sinless. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He was our sacrifice on the cross. It, the, the gospel is the death the burial, and the resurrection. Now the thing is, in between that, when he was buried, it tells us in Acts chapter 2 that confirms what we saw in Psalm 16 that his soul went to hell. Now I don't think his soul burned down there because God doesn't burn. He made fire. But he went down there. He's taking care of business. He's showing something important. He died. He was buried. He went to hell. He resurrected on the earth that very same day. He said, touch me not. I've not yet ascended to my Father, but go right and tell your brethren. Hebrews 9 bridges that gap here where he tells us that he entered into the tabernacle, not the one made with hands, the one that's in heaven, and he sprinkled his blood as a sacrifice on the mercy seat for the sins of the whole world. That same day he comes back down. He enters into the room where the disciples are meeting, and he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That was the beginning of the New Covenant. That was the beginning of the New Testament. It was not in Acts, and it was not on the cross. The Gospel must include the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and triumphantly now, in the New Testament, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So Christ came to reform the old system, and now we've been sent in the same way with great power 
preaching the gospel, so he gave us the Holy Ghost, the indwelling, in a unique and new way that they didn't have in the Old Covenant. But this phrase at the end of verse 10, it only uses this word one time, Reformation. The time of the Reformation. Now this comes up because just recently in having a conversation with somebody, it was like, well, uh, we're Reformed. You're, you're what? You're Reformed. Oh, you got arrested, you went to jail, you were, you were what, a car thief, and now you're reformed. You don't do that anymore. Is that what you mean? That's not what they meant. Okay. The title of my sermon tonight is Reformed What? Right? Now, if I said, uh, Brother Donald, are you reformed? And you say, hey, man, I used to do this, and I used to do that, to, you know, not for God's glory, and thank God I have reformed my life, and I don't do that, right? Does that make sense? That reform means you've changed something. Here, Jesus came to change the covenant and the sacrifice and the temple and the priesthood. This is why we understand there is the priesthood of the believer. What this person was talking about was they were a reformed what? Catholic. Catholic. I want you to understand something. Some people you say, oh, I'm Reformed. What do you mean by that? Oh, I'm a, we're a Reformed uh, Baptist church. Well, that doesn't exist. That's an oxymoron. Amen. Thank you. And there's much debate about that. There are many Baptists that came out of Presbyterian schools and started teaching Presbyterianism to the Baptists, leading them astray. Reformed what? Well, we're, we're a Reformed Christianity. Reformed theology. Here's the problem. Catholics historically have not claimed to be the same church as Christians. Christians that believe in salvation by faith alone without the Pope, without baby baptism, without all their sacraments, without their purgatory. We've always been separate and distinct. There's always been a remnant of God's people that have been saved by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, not by church ordinances or high church organizations. So when somebody says, I'm Reformed, I want you to point it out to them, you are a Reformed Catholic. And I'm here to tell you, if they're a Reformed Catholic, they're still a Catholic. That means they're teaching Catholic doctrine. They're teaching Catholic doctrine. Dominionism. Domin or or, or um, um, uh, kingdom theology. We're in the kingdom now. Christ is not going to come back and reign. He, it was all figurative. We're supposed to bring it in by a sword. So vote for whoever's going to have the biggest sword, and let's go conquer this world in the name of Christ. That's a very Catholic concept, and you do find it in a lot of the Reformed movements. Reformed what? Reformed Catholic. This is also, there are many code words and labels uh, many people sometimes will talk about the sovereignty of God. I noticed this is in one of the hymns we picked uh, for tonight. And um, God is sovereign, truly. That means He is the King. He's in charge. I really believe that God has divinely changed the course of my life by maybe, and I always use the example because it comes to mind, when He gave a red light and I wanted to go instead of the green light. And it saved my life. I, it spared me from a wreck. I thank God for saving my life in that way. But let me tell you where God is not sovereign. He does not force people to be saved. That's a choice. This is important because many people that are Reformed, they redefine things. Just like the Mormons, when they say grace, they don't mean biblical grace. Well, many of the Reformed people are the same way. When they say baptism, the Mormons, they definitely don't mean the same thing that we mean. Well, guess what? The Presbyterians, the Reformed, the Calvinists, they don't mean that either. They mean something different. I, I, I challenge you, if you know somebody that's in Reformed theology, they're really still teaching Catholic doctrine, which is not biblical Christianity by any means. Their authority is some scholar in some high castle that argued with some other scholar, and they came up with some big word, some term, to come up with a new doctrine, and then they wrote it down, and they said, agree to my creed if you want to be right with the church. Many of those creeds contradict, clearly contradict the Bible. Almost every creed swears allegiance to the Catholic Church. Do they not? Allow me to introduce you to a Roman Catholic Reformed teachings of John Calvin. The Gospel of John Calvin is different than the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Just as much as the Gospel of Joseph Smith is different than the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a man-made system. And it's not biblical. John Calvin was a French lawyer. He was Roman Catholic the majority of his life. He protested 
papal Catholicism, and he reignited a movement that was known as Augustinianism, Gnosticism. Augustine taught Gnosticism. If you've ever seen the secret society, the Masons, they have a big G. That stands for Gnostic. They worship knowledge. They, they teach, they have the esoteric, the hidden knowledge. We have the secret teachings of all ages. And if you're one of us, we'll let you in. But if you cross us, we'll kill you. I mean, that's what secret societies are founded on the same doctrines as Calvinism is today. It has the, literally the same historic roots. I want you to know that John Calvin never claimed to be born again. He never claimed to be born again. In fact, he proclaimed that his infant baptism into the Catholic Church was his source of salvation. That's what he pointed back to. Listen, if I picked any one of you out of the crowd and I said, uh, tell me when you got saved, most of you would say, well, I remember the day. Uh, Miss Marianne, I'll pick on you for a minute. Somebody knocked on her door and preached hell to her, and it shook her up to the point where she's praying that God would send another soul winner to knock on her door again, and another soul winner came back, and they preached the gospel to her, and she believed it. She can remember the day, the moment, when she learned the difference between saved and unsaved. If I asked her today, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? She's not going to tell me, well, live a good life and be a good person and give my money and only say good words and not bad words. No, she's going to say, Jesus Christ. Trust in Jesus Christ. I believe in His sacrifice. He paid for my sin. He gave me the gift. Thank God for Jesus, right? I mean, that's salvation when you understand how awesome God is, how much He loves you, and He makes it real easy for you to be saved. Now, is living the Christian life always easy? <laughs> no. No way. In fact, it's probably one of the hardest things you can do is live up to the name of Christ. But it's worthy and it's honorable to try, to do your best. John Calvin never claimed to be born again. He counted his infant baptism as his salvation. That's a very Catholic thing. Uh, we, have, we, we may have a baptism in the next week or two. We had half a dozen in December None of them were babies. We have a new baby with us. Samuel, how old is he now? Two weeks. Two weeks. Perfect. Let's get him saved. <laughs> if we don't dunk him now, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, we're Presbyterians, right? If we don't sprinkle some water on him, then he's destined for hell. I'm being a, a little candid with it because I want to lighten the mood. This is a dark subject, and really, I take this very seriously because I really believe that Calvinism, Reformed Catholicism, those that protested the Catholic Church and came out and they changed the Catholic Church to be Catholic 2.0, I believe they teach a different God than the God of the Bible. Cruel and unforgiving, not giving hope, unmerciful. A God that will choose people and just say, you're damned to hell no matter what you do. There's no hope for you. You cannot be saved. I've created you just to burn. That's bizarre. That's wicked. These doctrines were based on Augustine. Augustine got his Gnosticism from origin. That guy was a pervert. We won't even go into that. But Augustine, Augustine was quoted 400 times by John Calvin. John Calvin per personally attended, eyewitnessed, or executed 50 people that opposed him in baby baptism and these types of doctrines. You cannot baptize a baby and get their soul into heaven. It's not anywhere in the Bible. The funny thing about the Presbyterians is they simply don't have one verse, not even one verse, not one, that justifies what they do. But they have a lineage of history with the Catholics now, when you rewind and you look at history and you find out that the Catholics figured out how to use the Bible to manipulate people, they kept it away from their language and their tongue, they deceived people, you, you, they wouldn't tell you what it said, they changed what it said, uh, they also used the Bible to say, we have the authority, we are a political government on earth ordained of God, what we say goes, oh, and by the way, you owe us some taxes, wait a minute, you had a new baby? Well, if you don't baptize that baby, it will go to hell. Now that I've got you scared of that, we baptize the baby. Now I know of it. Let's put it on the register so I get my nickel every year. That's what they did. They wanted to tax the people. It was a method of taxation. John Calvin, he defines baptism, this is a quote, as 
the sign of the initiation by which we are received into the society of the church in order that and grafted to Christ we may be reckoned among God's children. Go to Romans 11 with me, please. Go to Romans 11. John Calvin literally taught that when you baptize a baby, they are engrafted into the body of Christ. This is their salvation. Engrafted into Christ, we may be reckoned among God's children. It's John 1.12 that says, To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that, listen, listen, believe on his name. Not everybody in the world are children of God. Oh, we're all God's children. That's not what the Bible says. In Genesis 5, it gives us this illustration, there are the sons of Adam. And then Genesis 6 tells us there are the sons of God, those that are saved. We were all of Adam in that lineage, right? We had a common ancestor. And then there are those that trusted in God and they were saved. Jesus made the example. He said, the children of the world. We read that this morning. The children of the world. That's everybody. You're in the flesh. But that's different from what he used, the children of light. We're called the children of God. Galatians 3.26 would tell us that we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. It's not because I was baptized that I'm the children of God. I'm a son of God. It's by faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3. You're in Romans 11. I want you to see this because John Calvin said that baptism will engraft a baby into the body of Christ. But the Scriptures are going to contradict it. I want you to see this. Look at verse number uh, 18 with me, please. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. By the way, Jesus is the root of our salvation. We're in that tree of life now. Uh, that when you're born as a baby, I believe children are innocent and preserved. And if you don't believe, you're broken off by unbelief. If you believe, you're grafted in and you're put into that tree. But Jesus Christ is the root. Okay, Verse number 19, Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. This is important because you, this is a time when the Jews who had the oracles of God should have known that Jesus was God and Christ, and they were rejecting Him. And the Gentiles who had not heard the Old Testament Scriptures, when Christ was preached to them through the power of the Holy Spirit, they received Christ, they believed on Him for salvation. And He said, now look, don't get too puffed up and proud of yourself because the Jews ignorantly rejected Him. They, have, they still have a a chance to get saved, but being a Jew does you no good if you're not trusting in Christ. Look what he says. He said, because he says, we're, we're, they stand us by faith, verse 21, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell, severity but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. Now listen, what he, what he, he's not saying you can lose your salvation and cast out of the root, but what he's saying is he's speaking to somebody saying you've heard of Christ and you believe in Christ. I hope you're not believing in vain because if you trust in Christ, you're in the tree. Verse 23, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Now, now take this to the New Covenant. He's speaking the Old Covenant. Yeah, they were broke off because they didn't believe in Christ. New Covenant. Hey, I'm saved, therefore automatically all my children go to heaven. Is that right or wrong? That's wrong. Now, if they don't stay in unbelief, but if they choose to believe on Christ, they get put in that tree, and that root being Christ, they're in the family of God, the body of God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So he says that we enter in by faith. It does not say that we enter in uh, by baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you would. We are grafted in by faith, not baptism. I give the example several years ago. We had a, a big soul winning event. We had some folks come in from town. And this guy, I'll never forget it, he, he came in and he had a tattoo of Florida on his cheek. And he was from Georgia. 
And we had several baptisms that day. And he said he wanted to get baptized. And it's my duty to ask somebody why they want to get baptized, what they have to do to go to heaven. And one of the, he said, I just, I want to get baptized. That way I know. Wait, 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 whoa, whoa. That way you know? In his mind, if I just go under the, if I go up to the front and I go under the water and I do the thing and everybody sees me, then I'll know for sure. I can always point back and say, I trust I went under the water. I know it happened for sure. Going under the water does not wash away your sins. <laughs> uh, when we were at the other building, we had, uh, uh, some people call it a redneck hot tub. We had a horse trough with heated water for our baptisms. And Brother Jake would always joke after the baptisms. And he would say, now be careful kids, we're, we're, we're pouring these sins out. You know, because people really believe that their sins are washed away by water instead of by Christ. And he would go, oh, be careful, that's sinful water. You know, don't get it on you, it's dirty, right? Well, that's not how it goes. We can't clean our soul by cleaning our flesh. You're in 1 Corinthians 1, if you would. Find verse number 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Listen, underline this in your Bible. Underline this in your... If this is a Bible you write in, you highlight in, you need to know this verse. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. What he's saying is, let's not get distracted about who got baptized and who baptized them and how they did it and where they were and what church they were in. He says, in fact, you know what? I hope I never baptized any of you, uh, but I want to preach the gospel to you and get you saved. He's making a very clear distinction here. He says the gospel is one thing, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and baptism is another thing, and you can get baptized and not have the gospel, and you can have the gospel and not get baptized. And Jesus in the Great Commission, He wasn't telling me, go and baptize. And that's it. No, no. He said, go and preach the gospel. And that's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Not baptism for the remission of sins. Now, some people mistakenly use Acts 2.38 saying they think they have to repent of all their sins to receive remission of sins. But that's not what it's saying. These were men that were already pricked in the heart. He said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord in that chapter in verse 21 says, shall be saved. I, I believe in Christ. I want to be saved. I'm trusting in Him. And this is now what should we do? Well, now that you're saved, what you ought to do? You need to change your mind. And yeah, now you need to get baptized as an outward experience demonstrating to the world that you were in unbelief, but now you're in Christ spiritually. It was a symbol. It's a sign. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. Flip ahead a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. John Calvin, let me give you another quote from him. We must realize that at whatever time we are baptized, we are once for all washed and purged for our whole life. Do you understand what he's saying? This is called baptismal regeneration. I know I'm saved because I went under the water. This is heresy. This, listen to me, this is Catholic. It's Presbyterian. It's Reformed. It's Catholic is what it is. We must realize that at whatever time we are baptized, we are once for all washed and purged for our whole life. Therefore, as often as we fall away, we ought to recall the memory of our baptism and fortify our mind with it, that we may always be sure and confident of the forgiveness of sins. For through baptism it administered only once seemed to have passed, it was still not destroyed by subsequent sins." He's saying, have confidence if they told you that they baptized you as a baby. Have trust in your baptism that it washed away your sins once for all. Don't get baptized again. This is heresy. It was after they believed in Christ that they got baptized. They went under the water. They came out of the water. Baptism does not save. Jesus saves. His payment was once and for all. Anybody that says they're trusting in their baptism, they are not saved. And once you're in Christ, you can never be lost whether or not you are baptized. You're in 1 Corinthians 12. I want you to see this in this spiritual baptism. He says in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for as the body is one, 
and hath many members, and all the members of that body, being many, are one body. He's talking about the church. In this church, we're one body together, and God has picked every one of you to come together. Now, some people said, well, I know God wants me here, but I didn't want to come. I wasn't faithful, right? Some people fall out, or some people show up that don't belong, but God wants to build a church, and He brings the talent and the gifts and the people together, right? But notice what He says, we're one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, for by one Spirit... We are all baptized into one body. This is spiritual baptism, if you will. This is teaching when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed with His Holy Spirit of promise. You are immersed in the Holy Spirit by faith. It's not talking about when you went under the water, now you're in Christ. That's not what it says. He says, for by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. You know, elsewhere he says, you're neither, you're no more Jew or Gentile. You're Christian. We're either in Christ or you're nothing. All believers are sealed with that same Holy Spirit of promise at salvation, if you will. We are immersed with the Holy Spirit. Hey, then we should obey the commandment and get baptized in the flesh as an outward symbol. Go to Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8. There were many bizarre quotes from John Calvin, and I, I didn't want to go through them all. I, I just want to help you guys understand something. There are some folks that are well-meaning that are under the guise of a Reformed church, and they don't understand why things aren't adding up. I want you to know this. Listen to me. You can be saved by faith in Jesus Christ, and then come under bad teaching. And you can repeat bad teaching of man-made doctrine. So that doesn't mean, well, you know, I saw somebody one time and he said something that sounds Calvinistic. Does that mean he's a damnable heretic? No. No, not necessarily. But I do want you to understand, as with the Pharisees themselves, the leaders and the teachers that were pushing this false gospel, a works gospel, they knew what they were doing. And they were condemning souls. They were trying to deceive people intentionally. And there are some people out there like that. Many of your Calvinist leaders, when you look up what they say you have to do for salvation, they can't even tell you. John MacArthur, he's got, it takes two hours for him to tell you how to be saved, and in it, he's teaching a works gospel that if you don't make Jesus the Lord of your life and you don't do all the commandments, then you're probably not preserved, you're probably not one of the elect, so you might as well give up, you're a reprobate. That's horrible. What a horrible thing to teach somebody. Can you imagine if we came to every teenager as they started to grow in life and their body the, the chemicals are going crazy in their mind and they're thinking about marriage and l lust and covetousness and just distractions. And then you come to them and you say, if you ever have a covetous thought, you might be a reprobate. Oh man, if I think a bad thought, that means I'm damned to hell and there's nothing I can do about it. I can't even be saved by believing in Christ. That's horrible, right? Well, I mean, what, what a burden to put on somebody. What confusion. The gospel is simple. The gospel is easy. Jesus did all the hard work. All we have to do is take the gift by faith. Acts chapter 8, look at verse number 12 if you would. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, and two week old babies. Uh, is that what yours says? Did I add that? I'm sorry. I'm not changing the word of God. It says men and women. Now, I believe children can be saved as well. There is that age of accountability where they begin to understand and comprehend. If a child cannot comprehend that they're a sinner and they've broken God's law and that Jesus loves them and saves them, well then, you know, I mean, they have to come to that mental point where they can comprehend that. That's important. What that age is is probably different for everybody. So I don't want to put, oh, it's 5, it's 7, it's 12, it's 18. I'm not going to put a line on it. Yours might be different than mine. But here's what I will do. I'll point out in this verse that he said, after they believed, then they got baptized. What's keeping me from being baptized right now? Well, have you chose Christ? In fact, in this same chapter, this one's famously edited out of every Catholic Bible. 
Every Catholic Bible, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, they attack these scripts. And so every new Bible that comes out, the ESV, the LSV, the ASV, I could go on, give me 10 more. I'm right. They all do the same thing. They literally delete this verse. Let's look at it. Verse number 36. Well, I tell you what, let's back up to 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. That's where the power is at. And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So he preached Jesus. He gets it. Hey, I want to get baptized. And here's the question, the million-dollar question, verse 37, that's deleted out of every other Bible. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What do you have to do to be saved? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and understand that by being the Son of God, that means He died for your sins. He paid for it all. I'm trusting in Him. Hey, I want to get baptized. What do I have to do? We have to be saved. Okay, I believe that. Let's get baptized. It comes after. Verse 38, And He commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, I have to point it out because the Catholics, the Presbyterians, the Orthodox, you know, they, they'll swoosh a baby through water, they'll pour water on a baby, they'll sprinkle a baby. You can't find that anywhere in the Bible. Here's the one thing you see in the Bible. People that trusted in Christ went down in the water just as Christ went in the grave, and they come up out of the water just as Christ came out of the grave. It's the same picture. It's the same picture. John Calvin said, Baptism is properly administered to infants as something owed to them. We owe it to the babies to baptize them. Why? Because so, he's teaching they can get saved. Go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Let me give you another John Calvin quote. The children of the godly are born the children of the church. I'm going to pause on that for just a second. The children of the godly are born as the children of the church. Now, generally speaking, I could agree with that statement in the sense like, Brother Chad is saved, and he is part of this church, and when he brings his family, he brings his whole church, right? But when God sets the members in the church, he's bringing those that are saved. Church is not for the lost. This is why when we have a visitor, I want to preach the gospel to them, which is another reason why we don't do an altar call. I mean, and I don't want to get off track on this, but uh, altar calls present a few different problems. Where the Ten Commandments is given, it says clearly not to make steps and call it an altar. So, number one, we don't want to do that. Number two, I don't want to play emotional music and try to manipulate your heart and force you into making an emotional decision that you might regret later. Pentecostalism is huge on this. Oh, I promise I'll never do it again. And you walk out the door and you're like, man, I want to do it right now. That's the flash. That's the flash. I do believe that preaching ought to call you to make a decision. But altar calls aren't really found in the Bible. This is not an altar. These are steps. I don't want to manipulate you and get an emotional decision out of you. Um, but we should preach the gospel to people on an individual level. That's kind of, and that's my third reason. As you notice, when we had people come in, I try to talk to them, or Brother Jake, or Brother Chad, or Brother Doug. Somebody, hey, man, are you saved? What do you have to do to be saved? Tell me about when you got saved. I had a guy recently, and I said, uh, tell me about when you got saved. And he said, or, or said, when did you get saved? And he said, you mean when I gave my life to Christ? Now, for me, that was a red flag. Now, I'm willing to be patient and just think maybe you're using bad terminology. But here's the thing. The day that I got saved was definitely different from the day that I chose to finally give my life to Christ. Okay? Jesus gave his life for me. I believe that. I got saved. I'm written in the book of life, and no one will blot it out, it says in Romans, Revelation chapter 3. And I felt the calling of God in my life, and I felt that he wanted me in ministry. And I tell you, I was about a teenager, and I'm thinking, man, I need to start living for God because I really feel God's calling on my life. And, you know, here I'm failing, and I know I can do better. I want to give my life to Christ. 
as a living sacrifice. It's a different day. Well, I don't have to serve Christ to go to heaven. I have to believe him. I have to receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. So John Calvin says, the children of the godly are born the children of the church, and that they are accounted members of Christ. That's where it becomes a big problem. Listen to this. They are accounted members of Christ from the womb because God adopteth us upon this condition that he may, also, may, he may be also the father of our seed. God forbid that we would lose any of the children in this church that would reject the Lord and not get saved and go out and live a wicked life. God forbid. God forbid. But salvation is an individual thing. And there are many churches, and yeah, let's say it, many Baptist churches, let's go farther, many independent, fundamental, King James only, Baptist churches where it's full of hypocrisy, and behind the scenes they're hypocrites and they don't really serve God, and maybe they have a bad attitude and they gossip about everybody, and the children are raised in this church and they just think, I know how to put on a show and I'll put on a face, but boy, when I'm 18, I am out of here. I'm tired of this, this fake church. God forbid that would happen here. It's an individual choice. You're in Acts chapter 11, if you would. Look at verse number 21 with me. Acts chapter 11, verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. This is biblical repentance. You believe, you turn to the Lord. You change your mind about Jesus, you trust Him for salvation. Jump ahead to verse 26. So they got saved, verse 26. And when He had found Him, He brought them unto Antioch. And it came to pass a whole year that they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Let me say this clear as day. You're not in Christ by baptism. You're not in Christ by birth. Just because you're born to a Christian family doesn't put you in the church. It doesn't put you in Christ. It doesn't put you in the book of life. It's an individual choice. Here they believed. Then they're called, hey, you were with the church and they called them Christians. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. It's not just Calvin. All of you reformers have this same problem. They're really Catholics. It's Catholic doctrine, and they're trying to bring it into every Baptist church in town. This is a big problem. It's everywhere. Brother Paul preached about it in his men's preaching night sermon last, last couple months ago, whatever, about First Baptist downtown, how they slowly started whittling away, and next thing you know, they're just outright preaching a works gospel that you have to work your way to heaven. It's shameful. Luther, another famous reformer, taught that it was a commandment for children to baptize them. He said, infant baptism is required in accordance with the imperial law, but also on the foundation of Augustine's teaching on the necessity of the purging ritual. Well, Augustine said it purges your sins, and therefore it's a commandment we have to baptize babies. Luther preached a false gospel. He was still a Catholic. He rejected the Catholics. He protested the Catholics. He reformed the Catholics. And you know what? He's still a Catholic. Hey, no, no amount of people that move from New Jersey to Florida, it doesn't make them a real Southerner, okay? Right? We were joking about this earlier because, like, all the Californians and uh, Noah, Noah French, brother Johannes, he's from California. He's considering moving here. So I don't say this about him. He's the exception, all right? But like the, new, the people from New Jersey, they leave New, they've ruined New Jersey with communism and taxes and all these problems, and they leave and they come here to Florida, and you know what they call it when a rat's leaving a sinking ship? You know what? They're still a stinking rat, okay? Don't bring your communism here and ruin Florida. We love Florida, all right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Just because you left Catholicism, when you brought all of her wicked pagan doctrine, that doesn't mean you're no longer a Catholic. When you reject Catholicism and you trust in Christ alone and His Word alone, and they all try to say this, solo scriptor, they don't believe that. They, they preach a creed. They believe a creed. And they'll argue with you. You don't believe me? I went to Trinity, uh, Trinity College over here, Trinity Baptist College, and I sat down with a Calvinist professor to debate Calvinism with him in front of about 50 or 60 students. And he pulled out the London Baptist Confession from 1869, and I said, no, sir, close that. Go back to Romans chapter 9. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Close your book. Come over here. Let's talk about that. 
Go to Ephesians 2. Zwingli, he's another one, another reformer. He believed that all infants ought to be baptized because they are a part of God's people. He taught that they were born into the new covenant. The new covenant is salvation. It is the New Testament. It is salvation. If you have not trusted in Christ, if you have not chosen to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not saved. You are not in the new covenant. I don't care if your name is on the roll of 10 churches in town. I don't care if you've been baptized 15 times. It's your heart. Salvation is of the heart between you and God. And here's the cool part. Listen, guys. It's not you, me, and God. I'm not going to come as well. I don't think you got to come up to my standard. No, no, it's you and God, period. Between your heart and God and no one else. You don't have to go through me to get to Him. That's what Jesus is for. Him alone. The new covenant salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by baptism or by church. Now, Ephesians 2.8, very famous. Let's look at it. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I want you to underline in your Bible, saved through faith. Uh, we bought a van, we sold a van to sell the van. This guy called me from Tampa and he's talking about the van and all this stuff. And church came up. I don't know how that happens. It seems like everybody I talk to, <laughs> just church comes up somehow. The Lord comes up one way or another. And we started talking about church and he says, and I says, oh, cool. What kind of church do you go to? Okay. And I said, what do you... Uh, what do you think you have to do? It came up and I said, I said, would you say, because he was like some community church or something, do, doesn't really mean anything, what it, the name meant. And I said, would you, would you believe that you're saved through faith? I'm literally quoting Ephesians 2.8. Yeah. He goes, saved through faith? No, you're saved by grace. Well, now wait a minute. Well, now wait a minute. That's different. I know it says we're saved by grace. It says it more than one time. It also says we're saved by faith. It says it more times. But what happens is Calvinism likes to use code words. Well, I believe God is sovereign. What do you mean by that? What they mean is God picked me and I'm special and we'll know it in the end because I'm going to endure sinless. Eventually I'll become sinless. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not grace. Grace is a gift, but Calvinism does not teach that. They say faith is a gift. They literally teach that you are born again before you hear the gospel. It's the opposite of what Romans 10 teaches us. They teach us that God picked you from the foundation of the world, and the Holy Spirit moves inside of you and regenerates you, and then He forces you to have faith. He gives you that faith as a gift. Whoa, whoa, what was that? Something's going on in my heart. I just had this miraculous event where all of a sudden it's like, I, I get it, I'm saved. Why? By God's grace. Well, what do you believe? Well, I believe God is sovereign. But what do you believe about Jesus? Because He's called us to repent and believe on Him. He's called us to trust in Christ and nothing else. This is a big deal. And listen, I believe both. What's it say? By grace are ye saved through faith. We need them both. But some very basic English language would teach you that it's not the faith that is the gift here. It's the grace that is the gift. Now, I believe God creates us with the ability to have faith. He gave me water in a bottle, and I get to choose whether I want to pour it on the ground or whether I want to drink it. God made you with the capacity to believe, to trust, to have faith. And then He reveals Himself to you through nature, His creation, but then especially through the Word of God and preaching through the Holy Spirit. And he says, now take that faith that you already have, and I want you to believe in me. Choose where you want to pour your faith, if you will. Verse number 9, obviously he says, not of works, lest any man should boast. And many Calvinists literally say that faith is a work, therefore it's not by your faith. They say, if you choose to believe on Jesus, that's you working your way to heaven. And therefore, it can't be of works. And they're literally turning this verse upside down on its head. Now, I don't care whether you read it in the Greek or whether you read it in the English. What they're doing is not right grammatically. 
<laughs> or doctrinally, for that matter. Amen? Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. All right, once you're saved, God has good things for you to do. It's still your choice. That's why he said you should walk in them, although we don't always. Hey, my children should keep their room clean, but <laughs> they don't always. You know, I still stub my toe on stuff in the middle of the night, right? Because we're fleshly disobedient children. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. This is important. He's preaching to the Galatians. He said, you used to be of the nations, you used to be a Gentile in the flesh, who are called the circumcision, who are called, I'm sorry, uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. He says, there's a group of people. They have circumcised their flesh. And by the way, circumcision is not salvation. That's not what that covenant ever meant. If so, that means women could not be saved. Period. There were those that got circumcised and then they were cut off anyway. Whether they were saved or not, they didn't get it. There were people that were saved without circumcision in the Old Testament. Circumcision was a sign of circumcising your heart. He says that more times in Deuteronomy than he does the flesh. But here he says, you, there's a group of people that have circumcised their flesh and they're saying you're not saved because you have Christ they're saying they are saved because they have circumcision. Go figure. Today there are those that say, I was baptized as a baby into a Presbyterian church. That's how I know I'm saved. And I say, you don't have Christ. You haven't chosen Him. Verse 12 again, he says that at that time you're without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Hey, now you're no longer an alien. Now you're in Israel. He says, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Listen, we're saved by Jesus Christ. We believe in His blood. We believe in His cross. We believe in His resurrection. We're trusting in His finished work. That's the only way I'm going to heaven. I have chosen to believe in Him. It's no work for me to choose Him. All I get to do is observe and hear and judge, and I judge that He is true. And His testimony is righteous and true. And thank God for that. And now I'm no longer a stranger from the covenant of promise of salvation, he says, I'm in the commonwealth of Israel. I'm the people of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Go to Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. Somebody I was speaking with recently made the point. He said, um, I came out of one religion, went into another. I started going to this church, and they're Calvinistic, and they have this Sunday school. They're teaching all this stuff. And I was amazed at all the facts and the knowledge and the things I'm learning. I hadn't learned in a Pentecostal church. And he said, until I got to this point... The word that offended me was determinism. Determinism means that God has already predetermined everything that will happen and everything that you will do. If you stay awake through this whole sermon, God has predetermined it. If I preach against predeterminism, it's because God has predetermined it. And I had no choice in the matter. Determinism. God has foreordained both good and evil. And this is where Calvinism gets weird. God picked people to do evil things and He made them do it. That's a different God. It's also called fatalism. It's a fatalistic or nihilism. Oh, I have no choice. Nothing matters. No, everything matters. You do have choice. It's up to you. God sees your heart. He judges your heart. He knows your conscience. And He loves you so much, He's given you an option to choose your eternal fate. Not on whether you're good or evil, because we're all evil. Yeah. It's on Him. That really is the most beautiful thing. Now again, we're saved by faith. We are not, listen, this is important. We are not saved by praying a prayer. Our, our church invites, on the back of them, it's got to pray this prayer. You cannot just pull that out and read those words and go to heaven. You must have faith. The prayer is just simply a way of saying, I believe what He said. I'm calling on the name of the Lord because I believe His promise. The prayer should be an evidence of what you have. So we're saved by faith, not a prayer. We're not saved by an altar call. We're not saved by church membership. We're not saved by baptism. John Calvin said this, no person since Adam has ever had a free will. Every unsaved person is free to go only in one direction, free to go down. 
and burn. That doesn't sound like a loving God. God gave you a choice. You don't have to go to hell if you don't want to. John Calvin also is quoted as saying, God decrees sin. That's a different God. It's a different grace. It's a different church. It's a different God. It's a different gospel. It's a different covenant. I want you to understand Calvinism in a nutshell. It's a whole nother religion. It's Catholicism. It's not Christianity. If I could pass a few of these out, I passed some of these out. I had these on the back in this morning. If I could get Brother Pax, if you'd come help me, sir. I've got little ones and I've got big ones. Little ones will fit in your Bible. The big ones, Brother Larry's going to need a real big one, if you don't mind. He's... <laughs> Ouch. I know he's going to get me back as soon as he can. Now, this chart is on our website, lawoflibertybaptist.com slash calvin.png. You can pull it up on your phone. You can share it. It is in the description of this video as it's being live streamed right now. We've taught through this chart a few different times. And um, frankly, if you have anything to add to it, please let me know because um, I believe that you know, uh, uh, this can be a great tool to help empower us and educate us when you talk to somebody that says, I'm Reformed. And you say, Reformed Catholic? Oh, no, no, no. Well, you are. That's what you're teaching. One of the things on this chart, there's a little cartoon here, and it's a tree with God reaching his hands around the tree, holding a puppet of a snake, and then holding the puppeteer strings over Adam and Eve, like he's playing a game making Adam and Eve obey the snake. That's Calvinism in a nutshell. And if you don't believe me, I'd like to give you a quote from John Calvin that says that. God forbade them to eat of the tree of knowledge, but ordained them to do just that. Then punish them for doing what he ordained them to do. Can you imagine? Don't do it. He made them do it. Then he punishes them for doing it. That's John Calvin's Catholic view of God. It's messed up. In this tulip chart, we're not going to go through it tonight. I know I've probably already gone longer than I should have. I'll, I'll be brief from here on out. Take this and study it for yourself. Look at it for yourself. Prove it to yourself. Open up the Bible. Don't just take my word for it. I tried to give you a summary of the verses so you can read it at a glance. But a lot of this can be summarized by... Uh, the predestination concept. Being predestined, uh, for instance, there is a flight in Jacksonville tonight that is flying to Atlanta. It is predestined. It is going, it's already going. It's going to leave here and it's going to Atlanta. It already has a predestination. The question is, will you get on the flight? That's up to you. That's your choice. You don't have to get on the flight. You don't have to worry about the flight. God does have foreknowledge. He knows our choices before we make them. God does not force sinners to sin, nor does He force believers to stop sinning. God gives us the choice to obey. You're in Romans chapter 8. If you would, look at verse number 29. For whom He did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, uh, God foreknew who would believe. It doesn't say forced anybody. He saw what we would believe. Predestination is based on foreknowledge. Now listen, God knows the beginning from the end, right? He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Creator and the Judge. He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and He knew that He would die for the sins of the whole world. Even before you were born, He knew every mistake you would make, and He loved you enough, He paid for it all. He knew that He would go to the cross for you. That was His choice. He knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that Peter would deny him. He still did it. He did not eliminate free will. He did not eliminate free will and force them to sin against him. Nor does he force you to sin against him either. God created free will. And I want to remind you, Lucifer has free will. All the angels have free will. They chose to rebel. 
just as much as human beings. Everything he created, angel and man, we have a choice. Are we going to believe? Are we going to obey? So in Romans 8, when he says, uh, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, does it say to be saved? Hello, anybody? Does it say to be saved? What does it say? It says to be conformed to the image of his son. Once you're saved, one day in the resurrection, you're going to look just like the Lord Jesus Christ. So knowing that I'll look like him in the resurrection, I should begin to choose to obey him and walk like him now. That's the purpose of this scripture. My final destination is the resurrection and the rewards. I know what's coming. It's time to get to work. I want you to think about it. So, so if we have free will, then what is not predetermined? What is not predetermined? Individual responsibility of salvation. It's up to you. You must choose. Or damnation. If you want to reject it, that's your choice. You have a choice to sin or to get saved. You have a choice to go out and preach the gospel and reproduce yourself spiritually. What is predestined according to the Bible? Well, here he says that believers will have a destination of heaven. The resurrection will be with the Lord. We get a new body. Those things have been predetermined. We've decided to get on the plane. We're on that ride, right? We know what we're, what we're looking forward to. He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son. We have the resurrection, the rewards, the renewal of our body. We have all that stuff. Again, John Calvin said, God forbade them to eat of the tree of knowledge, but ordained them to do just that. Then punish them for doing what he ordained them to do. That's confusion. That's double speak, isn't it? Um, man, for the sake of time, I, I got a lot I want to talk about tonight. Go to Hebrews chapter 2, please. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. I just want to encourage you, we were warned that there would be those that would pervert the gospel of Christ and preach another gospel. He said to let them be accursed, he said in Galatians 1. In Galatians 5, he said, Christ is become no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. If you say, I know I have grace because I keep the law, no, 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 you're fallen from grace. We can't be saved by the law. We're saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is preached all throughout the Bible, and men have written commentaries, and scholars have argued about this for years. And listen, throw all of that junk out and come to the Lord in humility. And just ask Him to help you understand as you read the Scriptures, just you and Him alone. And He'll reveal these things to you. In Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse number 1. He says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed, in other words, pay really good attention, to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. I want to encourage you in this. Pay attention to the scriptures we've heard tonight. Don't let it slip out of your memory. Don't let it slip out of your mind. Get a hold of it. Look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Remember this. It's your choice whether... Look what he says. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? There were many witnesses that told the same thing. And the Holy Spirit said this to people. Look at verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You should underline that in your Bible. You know what grace is? That whether or not you deserve it, because none of us do, he died for your sins. I want you to understand there are people in hell today because they rejected the gift of God. They let these things slip. They rejected and neglected so great a salvation. It was their choice. And here he says, the grace of God, that he tasted death for every man. I've noticed with Calvinism that there's a lot of bad fruit where children that grow up in it, they leave it and they say, I can't believe the God of Romans chapter 9 as it was taught to me and therefore I reject Christianity as a whole. And I guess I'm just a reprobate to them. And they literally choose to become a reprobate 
as they neglect God because they were taught a false God and a false gospel, fake grace. Here it says, every man. You know, he died for everyone. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that love? Finally, go to Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We'll finish here. Look at verse number 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You understand? The gospels preached, they understood it, but they didn't put their faith in it. They didn't receive it. That's sad. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into rest. This is awesome. He said, I mean, at the end of that verse, he says, the works were finished. Jesus Christ did the work. He paid for your sin. I have entered into rest. That's my Sabbath, the Lord Jesus Christ, because I mixed my faith with his gospel. Boom, I put the two together. It's like chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> it goes together so well. The gospel and faith, when you mix it together, it's a beautiful thing. Some say you can't have faith. It's sad. Look at verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David. What he's saying is, there's a warning. There's a warning. You've been told. Obey. Look, he says, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. You know what happens? We have our man-made presuppositions. Well, I was always taught this. And now I hear the truth about I have to believe in the gospel. You have to choose. Are you going to let that slip? He begins this chapter by saying, fear, look out, trust in Him, have faith, enter into His rest. He did all the works. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. Salvation is a matter of the heart. Finally, verse 10, he says, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works. You recognize you can't work your way to heaven. As God did from his, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Why did many of the Jews go to hell? They didn't trust in Christ. Verse 12, for the word of God is quick. That means it's alive and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let me tell you something. Don't approach a Calvinist with other man-made arguments. You approach a Calvinist with the Word of God, with the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's their choice by faith alone, and it's like a sharp sword that pierces right into their soul, and God convicts their conscience on the spot and reveals to them, hey, buddy, you need to obey the Word of God. We can't argue with an educated standpoint. No, just go with the Word of God. This is where the power is at. It's a spiritual sword. Verse 6, how do I get saved? Trust in Him. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Guys, I want to encourage you in this. There are Calvinists out there that will boldly say they're Calvinists and they'll argue for the Reformation and they'll argue for the doctrines of grace and the sovereignty of God and salvation, that God forces salvation. But when you come with the power of the Word of God, and you compel them and you convince them, that's why I give you this. This is a tool. Learn these verses. Put it in your Bible. Learn some of these points about how to answer them. And then tell them, come boldly to God's throne of grace and ask for mercy. Freely. It's whosoever will. Let him come freely. It's free. It's easy. Jesus did all the hard work. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Lord, I just pray that you would use these scriptures to penetrate our heart. 
Lord, help us to stand up for the truth and the simplicity of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would bless all of those that have willingly listened to this and just help them to understand the gospel better and understand